Hello, and thank you for tuning in to The Christian Skeptic. I'm your host, Sean Kerwin, and as always, it's my mission to take an honest look at our questions about Christianity through the lens of logic and reason. I'm not here to preach at you, just to start a conversation with you. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the third episode of The Christian Skeptic. You know when something just has like that that freshness, that new car smell, and, and you're just you're so excited to start on a project. Well, that's kind of how I feel about this show. Uh, I feel like this is just this is exciting. We're we're having discussions. We're talking about some of the big questions. I have so many questions. I, I think I have a list of about forty questions, uh, and, and I'm getting questions in. And it's just got that like it's got that new podcast smell. But before we jump into uh, just all, all of the different kinds of questions on uh, Christianity and living uh, a Christian life and, and who the God of the Bible is and does the Bible really say this. And, and uh, I feel like we need to start from ground zero. We need to start at, at base uh, before we begin to climb this mountain that uh, almost seemingly has no peak. But I feel like we need to establish a why. We, we, we need to start off by asking ourselves, why should we even think about God? Why is it important that we devote ourselves uh, for however long uh, I'm going to be speaking on this podcast and you're going to be listening, which I hope can be a long time. Why should we spend all this time doing this? Why should you tune in for 20 minutes to hear me ramble on on uh, my findings in the Bible, or philosophy, or even just my own journey. I don't know if you're like me, but I feel like most of us, and especially most of us that are probably tuning into this show, have at one point or another asked the question, well, why should I believe in God? What does that benefit me to believe in God? Or even maybe to phrase it another way, can't I find happiness without God? Can't I find a purpose in life without God? And maybe you've uh, asked a Christian friend, or maybe a Christian relative, maybe a Christian grandmother, and lovingly they have said to you, uh, no, you should believe in God so that you can have peace and so that you can have joy or happiness in life. And and maybe you asked the question back, maybe you just thought the question back, but can't I find that stuff on my own? Why should I believe in a God? Or why should I even get to the place where I'm open to there being a God uh, let alone the God that's presented in the Christian Bible. To get there, I feel like we need to start with what Friedrich Nietzsche would call the hermeneutics of suspicion. You see, in, in Nietzsche's writing, he taught that there were three wills, that there was a will to power, a will to pleasure, and a will to truth. And by will, he meant the thing that drove human decision, the thing that drives human thought, the thing that drives uh, so much of what we do. In other words, a, a motivation, right? Uh, a, a driving factor behind humans. And so let's break these down very quickly. Uh, so to sum it up, a will to pleasure to Nietzsche meant that anything you do, anything you believe, if you have a will to pleasure behind it, he said you are simply believing that thing because it gives you pleasure. You are doing that thing. You are in that career. You are going to school for whatever. You are uh, hanging out with the people you're hanging out with to get pleasure. Now, is this wrong? No, not always. Uh, when it comes to philosophy, though, and when it comes to truth, and when it comes to, uh, as we've already talked about, oughts, see reference to episode one, it is wrong to Nietzsche. Uh, he actually looked down on this, and, and, and so... Uh, he would look at politics and religion, and, and he would break down the decisions that they made. He would break down the policies they enacted, the, the rules they preached, and he would ask, why? Why are you doing that to a, a politician? He would ask, uh, why are you enacting a new law? Is it because you love justice and because you love the law? Or because if you enact this law, you'll become more popular with, with your constituents, and thus it will get you power. And that leads me to the will to power, which, similar to the will to pleasure, is the driving factor uh, behind uh, a decision, an action, a belief, a philosophy, 
is that it will get you more power. Uh, this may be political power, this may be religious power, this may simply just be power over your friend. Uh, if, if you can outsmart your friend, you have the power over them as the superior intellectual being. <laughs> um, and, and then this, this leads to the third one, which is the will to truth, which Nietzsche was very skeptical of humans. He didn't actually think that we could have a pure will to truth. And, and I'll admit that, you know, in a lot of decisions and a lot of things that we do in life, there isn't always a will to truth. There isn't always a, a forethought of, I'm doing this simply and solely because it's true. Uh, and, and that's the will to truth, right? So it's it's a belief because it is true. And that should be why we pursue God. That That should be why we even dare to ask the question, is there a God? Who is God? Which God is the correct God? Which word or, or spiritual text is of God? Now, I can't wait to get to some of these questions with you guys, but in order to get there, we have to establish uh, an agreement between you and I that our motivation for seeking God, for, for asking these questions, is truth, is, is the will to truth. It's kind of like when people would come up to Jesus in the New Testament. In the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Pharisees and, and Gentiles would, would come up to Jesus, uh, and, and, and Jews would come up to Jesus, and the Pharisees would question him, uh, and the, the common folk often would come to him to see a miracle. They would come to him because they'd heard about him. Now, some were investigating whether he was the true Messiah or not, but a lot of them wanted the show. A lot of them wanted to see Jesus, the one-trick pony. Maybe I'll get some bread and fish out of this one. Or, hey, you know, my ankle kind of hurts today. Maybe he can touch it, and it'll be all better by this evening. And so that's why Jesus spoke in parables. There's this one part in the Gospel of Matthew that he records in the 13th chapter where Jesus told a parable about a sower who went out to sow some seed, right? He was just throwing some seed on the ground. And he said, yeah, that's kind of what heaven's like. And then didn't say anything else. And so everyone, uh, maybe not everyone, but most around him were confused, including his 12 disciples. And so afterwards, uh, the 12 disciples go up to Jesus and they say, hey, dude, what the heck did that mean? And he said, and I quote, hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and shall not perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And so at first glance, you're kind of like, wait, what the heck, Jesus, aren't you supposed to be some kind of teacher? And he literally said, I speak in parables, and I'm paraphrasing, so I can confuse people. And that's the point, actually, because there's a lot of times where Jesus did a miracle, where Jesus healed someone or cast a demon out, and he strictly warned the person who received the miracle to not say anything about it. And so you would think God comes to earth, uh, people believe in the wrong gods, right? He, he probably wants the message to spread as wide and far as he can. And even later in the Bible, when we get to the, the book of Acts and we get to the epistles, uh, the letters written by Paul and the other disciples, there's a big emphasis on getting the message of Jesus out. Uh, and that's the point, though, is that the message wasn't that Jesus was just there to heal or to feed them food uh, or to turn water into wine or to do some sort of miracle and make their lives better. Jesus was there uh, for the gospel's sake, which was to die, uh, pay for the sins of the world, and raise again on the third day. We'll have an episode about the gospel as well later and what all of that means, but I kind of want to zero in on this point. You know, before recording this episode, I actually just Googled that question. I Googled, why should I believe in God? And it was fascinating. The entire first page uh, of results that I got, I clicked on all, um, okay, honestly, I clicked on most of the links, uh, but they were all the same. So many of the reasons I found on Google out there to believe in God were that it would give me a better life. It would give me a sense of peace. It would uh, help me feel fulfilled. 
I, I, I clicked on one link and watched one video where a gentleman uh, who probably meant well was talking about how if I chose to follow Jesus, the God of the Christian Bible, I would know myself better. And this is why Jesus spoke in parables is because so many people came up to him and they were in it for themselves. But I think we can all agree, maybe we can't all agree if there is an absolute truth out there or not. Uh, we'll, we'll, we will talk about that. We'll talk about truth. We'll talk about absolute truth. But I think we can all agree, though, if there is absolute truth out there, it's a lot bigger than you and I, right? If, if there is something out there that is absolutely 100% true, and especially if that thing is claiming to be God, claiming to have created all of the universe, claiming uh, to have knit everything together and then further sustain everything together, right? Claiming to have knit me together in my mother's womb, claiming to uh, have a will and a plan for my life and, and, and claiming to know me and then making claims about what's going to happen after I die, which is uh, often terrifying for most of us. It's a lot bigger than myself. It's a lot bigger than just finding joy or, or, or peace or meaning in life. Now, I'm not saying... If you believe in God, you won't get those things. I, I do think uh, that those are a byproduct of knowing God, of, of, uh, of being a Christian, a true Christian. But I think that if we pursue God and if we pursue Christianity because we think it'll give us more joy, we think it'll give us more peace, we feel like there's just something, gosh darn it, there's just something missing in my life, and I think God might be able to fill that little void in my heart. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not bashing anyone who has these desires. I think if you want joy and you want peace, and, and, and if there is something missing in your life, uh, more power to you. Uh, I, I think many of us go through that in life, but that shouldn't be the foundation of why we begin to ask questions about God. We should ask questions about whether there's a God, what God is the the, the right God, um, what spiritual text is the right text. We should ask those with a will to truth. We should ask those wanting to know what is true. And so if we take a look at this from a practical standpoint, what does this actually imply for us and for our lives? Well, I would say it implies that we take a closer look at the voices that we're listening to, uh, and, and perhaps even our own. And, and I would say that it's going to take some honest evaluation. Uh, I, I guess we'll start with ourselves. And so all of us have a subjective reality through which we view the world. Uh, and if you don't know the difference between objective and subjective, objective is that thing that is believed to be true outside of ourselves, and subjective is the thing that's believed to be true inside of ourselves. In other words, Something is objectively true if it's true no matter what I think about it, and something is subjectively true if it's true to me, right? So I'm sure you've heard that said, uh, this is my truth, that's your truth. So what we're talking about there is a subjective reality in which truth lives. Uh, objective reality is that thing that we mentioned earlier, uh, absolute truth, right? So all of us have a subjective truth that we view the world with. But I think a part of this agreement that we are making, uh, that I hope you're making with me, to pursue this idea of God, to ask the questions, ask the tough questions about God, I would also ask that you and I will do the same, that we try to look at God through the most objective lens possible, right? And so what that means then is maybe for you, uh, maybe for myself as well, we need to do some soul searching, right? We, we need to figure out, is there something within us that's hindering our ability to think about God, right? So is there something within us that's stirring up an emotional reaction uh, when we're trying to have a logical conversation, right? So, so the next thing I would also advise, uh, and really I would advise anyone to do this, uh, would be to stop listening to voices that just talk about their own opinion. I think this is probably worse in the Christian realm, where in the day and age in which we live, we have a lot of hypey and showy pastors, pastors who run their churches and for some reason think they need to put on a gimmick and have the cool videos and they have to wear the coolest and latest clothes that maybe cost more than I spent on my first car. $800, that's what I spent on my, for, on my first car, 
something else you learned about me, random fact. But I, I think that all of us need to evaluate if we're going to investigate Christianity, who we're listening to and who is actually preaching the Christianity that Jesus talked about in the gospel, right? We're talking about the same Jesus who could have put on quite a show. He could have literally put on a, a, a firework show to end all firework shows. He could have healed every single person on earth, and yet he didn't. There was a mission, a singular mission of his, which was the gospel, which is the gospel, and then afterwards, the the singular mission of Christianity was to proclaim that gospel as truly as possible, right? To proclaim, to proclaim it in, in truth. Paul, in one of the last letters of his life, exhorted his young friend, he called him his son in the faith, Timothy. He said, he told Timothy to preach the word in and out of season, right? To, to preach the scripture, which of course, Paul believed to be true, which of course, the Bible presents itself as true, uh, which, of course, being me being the Christian skeptic, uh, thus far, I am still convinced that the scripture is truth, right? And uh, so that's that's the why. That's the agreement that you and I need to make is that we need to pursue these questions about God with a will to truth, as much of a will to truth as we can, and also to be careful who we're letting in. And, and, and this this isn't just the hypey pastors, though. I bash on them, and I probably will bash on them without naming names, of course, in the future, because really, if you're going to be a pastor, you should probably read the instruction that Paul left to Timothy, who was also a pastor, to preach the word, not preach your ideas of what a fun and fulfilled life should be. Again, I, I think when you read the Bible, uh, a fulfilled life comes as a byproduct. I don't know about necessarily fun, because Jesus at one point also said, if you follow him, there's going to be tribulation. He said, great tribulation, but you can be of good cheer for he's overcome the world. And, and so perhaps then we even just take that, that simple claim of Jesus that said, following him will produce tribulation, right? Paul in his later letters wrote that tribulation is what produces good faith that trouble is going to come for the person who follows the God of the Bible. Ever since the earliest book, which is the book of Job, for those that aren't aware, Job had probably the worst trouble come upon him in life that was possible. I'm, I'm sure we'll even cover some questions about Job in this show. But nonetheless, the God of the Christian Bible doesn't actually promise a fulfilled life. He doesn't actually promise that you're going to live your best life, quote unquote. I had to put quotes around because I would really just hate myself if I actually just said, living my best life. Um, please forgive me and don't email me about that. But following the God of the Bible doesn't actually promise that. So really, it's a fallacy to pursue God so that you can have more peace or so that you can have more joy. Again, I truly believe those things come when you pursue God, but it's not about knowing you so much as it is about knowing truth, so much as it is about knowing who this God of the Bible is, who this God who, to quote Jesus, said, I am the truth, the way, the life. And so I'm using this episode as a precursor to the next episode where I am going to uh, be answering the question, can you prove the existence of God? So make sure to tune in to the next episode. And as always, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed the show today.